Did you hear the drunks? Did you hear them after midnight? He said. I lay awake all night, walked up and down. I even opened the window and let the air pour in, that terribly cold air. But it didn't do any good. I thought I might go down and complain. But there's no sense in that. I'd only encounter incomprehension. The thing that makes me most indignant is that incessant door slamming, like continually being beaten about the head. There's nothing worse than incessant door slamming in a house. People slam doors without the least thought. It's a trait of inferior humanity. Habitual door slamming is even capable of killing someone. My whole day is wrecked if someone slams the door. But here they slam them all the time. Imagine yourself forced to live somewhere where they continually slam the doors. A place inhabited by habitual door slammers. You're up against it, I tell you. He says, Look at my little shoes my little tiny shoes, and he presses on one of them with his cane, and I look at his shoes. My head is so swollen, I can no longer see my shoes. I have infinitely tiny shoes and very rickety legs. Infinitely tiny, infinitely minute shoes. And what these legs have to endure when I think of my head, I look like some sort of grotesquely swollen insect. My head is so heavy, a dozen strong men wouldn't be able to lift it. But my legs, those tiny little legs, they can manage it. I always take a foot bath in the evenings now. That helps. I can't see anything with my head. It's all grey and yellow. And then the colours start to run and I see nothing but pain. An extract there from Thomas Bernhard's 1963 novel. Frost. Frost, with a single word title, Frost is fairly articulate, considering what it is. It's a cold, bleak, depressing, miserable, pessimistic novel. And, and of course, I thoroughly enjoyed it, because that's my kind of thing. Um, Frost follows an unnamed young Austrian who has accepted a fairly peculiar assignment and it outlines a fairly intriguing and peculiar plot and plot device in a way. So it's about a young Austrian who is undertaking medical studies to, to become a doctor and his superior uh, assigns him a task of travelling to a, a a mining town, a very bleak mining town um, in the mountains called Veng, um, to clinically observe uh, an aged painter called Strausch, Strausch, who is his superior's brother. Um, there is sort of a catch, but it doesn't really matter, and you find out why fairly quickly. Catch is that Strausch must not know that the young man's true intention or reason for being there, or reason for his arrival, like there's no reason for him to be in this small town, is to observe this man and clinically observe him, how he's getting on, what he says, what his beliefs are, what his thoughts are. Um, so he poses as a sort of a law student with a love of Henry James, um, and they very quickly become what you might consider friends amidst um, a very small cast of local characters, all of whom, in my opinion, blend into one each other in a very interesting way. Not in the sense that they're badly written, but in the sense that this town itself is a, a very um, subsumptive beast in terms of human energy and feeling. Um, so the other primary characters really are an engineer and a landlady of the local inn, which is really where a lot of the uh, action <laughs> of the novel takes place. Now, the first thing... This all happens very quickly, and the the unnamed protagonist spends uh, about 30 days, I believe. Might be a little bit less. 26, sorry, 26 days he spends uh, in the mining town with observing Strauch. And these are all listed throughout the novel. That's the sections the novel is split into, is the first first day, second day, third day, etc. And so really what you're watching is a progression of, uh, in a way, 
psychoanalytical transference, uh, who is going to win the day, who is going to win, what themes and thoughts and ideas are going to win, what uh, successes and ideas are going to be developed. And of course, one would immediately think, well, we need to know what this Strauss fella is like. Well, Strauss is extremely pessimistic, uh, Chiron-esque, Schopenhauerian pessimism, uh, which borders on misery, which isn't something I'm always as keen on. I think there's a, a definite difference between pessimism, cynicism, um, depression, and misery. And being miserable is sort of a whining for me. Miserable is whining about the situation as opposed to theorizing about it and, and sort of utilizing the, the bleakness of the situation to open up something in the human condition. So Strauss is constantly just without even really being asked, um, reeling off page after page of pessimistic monologue about the most minor things there. The example I gave of door slamming, that this very minor thing which suddenly unfolds into an understanding of what it really is to be human, both generally and within this um, mining town. But largely, you, you're set up with this you're set up with this peculiar plot device uh, of someone having to observe another character or go and observe someone they've never met before. In this case, their suit, their boss's brother to find out, I don't know, you don't really, you don't really know why um, his brother wants him to be observed, but um, perhaps some sort of worry, but no one's really heard from him in a while, many years, in fact. And um, you, of course, as a reader, you think, well, how is he going to, open up to him, empathize with him. And it doesn't, there's, there is no real case of that. Um, the protagonist sits himself in a way which is, um, you know, not suspicious and tactical. He sort of waits around for about the first day for to, to have an opportunity to naturally speak with Strauss. But actually, he didn't really need to do that at all. And Strauss immediately just fires off some diatribe about how miserable life is. Now, one thing, this is the first Bernhard novel I've ever read. Um, so I came across Bernhard online when I was looking up pessimistic novels, because I enjoy pessimistic novels. And some people believe that Bernhard's pessimism is unmatched. I certainly think it's unique. And I didn't really know where to start. And this is his debut novel. And one um, comment said that, Actually, if, you, if you're going to enjoy Bernhard's work, you, in a way, they're one and the same in a good way. You will enjoy, if you enjoy one, you'll enjoy them all. So I did thoroughly enjoy this, but the, it does have its negatives, which I'll get to, which I, it appears Bernhard rectified in a way. Um, but I thought, well, I'll begin at the beginning. And um, I believe Bernhard was just in his early, very early 30s when he published this. And it's an amazing debut. Um, but what I like about Strauss as a character is that often, for instance, say, Cormac McCarthy, John Williams, Celine, um, not so much Chiron. We could say that if we if we do a spectrum of how much the author is clearly himself within the characters who themselves are pessimistic, you know, is the is the author just uh, almost abusing the template of a character to espouse their own view? On one side of that spectrum, we have someone like Cormac McCarthy, who is very explicit about, okay, some clearly there's some of his own ideas are in the characters, but he's written the characters for a specific purpose, and he's very reluctant of that idea of being taken into the characters themselves. They are, they are used as something more. Um, now, on the other end of that spectrum, even though he's not writing fiction, someone like Emil Chiron, um, as an aphorist and, and sort of pessimistic prose stylist and philosopher, is not so much entering into strict philosophy, but is utilizing the medium in a literary way to uh, not so much promote, but simply to articulate his own worldview. And what's very, very interesting about, about Frost and about the way Bernhard writes is that Strauss isn't apologized for. Uh, so the, the line between author and Strauss, or, or author and all the characters who have these pessimistic leanings, is so... F thin that it's almost as if Bernhard simply really couldn't care less whether or not you think this is to do with him or to do with the character or to do with some uh, um, other more complex structural device. 
uh, the world is created and, and the almost humorous thing about the way Bernhard writes this book is that there is no apologies for this worldview. There's no one, no one comes along to counter it or to try um, argue out of it. The argumentation in the debate has already taken place uh, in a sense. It feels that way at least. And the views of someone such as Strauss are completely widespread into the very fabric of the novel, into the very fabric of the town. And we see this most really in, in, in the notion of human relations in the novel is one of complete suspicion, distrust, um, cheating, lying, just the, the worst aspects of what it is to be a miserable, cold human being. And this is why this title, Frost, is really perfect, because we're in this mining town where um, often the snow is almost up to waist height, and anyone sits around too long. There is a moment, in fact, where Strauss sits around too long, and people worry about him, because if he was to sit in this one place too long outside of the inn, then you would actually die because it's that cold. But this, this, this really relates back to sort of how John Williams uh, wrote, writes about the seasons in Butcher's Crossing, except this time we're caught in a singular season of uh, existential winter, in a way, is this feeling at all times that when of when one gets cold to the bone, when you are so cold that your, your limbs and your bones are actually th sort of vibrating with, as if frost has... In got inside them and infected them and that feeling that no amount of cups of tea or stew or baths can really help until you've literally you you have to like sleep through the day and get to the next day to be able to ever warm up again except we're never given that next day in frost in the novel because well in this town in this mining town of vang it's just always this this bleak this cold this frosty and in a, in a sense, it reminds me of the biographical detail of Emil Chiron's life, of sort of these these biographical details of why it might be that someone uh, not only has this worldview, but is so continuous um, in, 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 in agreement with it. And someone such as Chiron with that insomnia, with that, you know, you go one day without a good night's sleep and you get into this strange mindset, very depressive, very peculiar. But you imagine someone's life uh, dealing with serious, serious insomnia. You can see why uh, such a, such a, an alien, inhuman and pessimistic worldview or nihilistic worldview would, would enter into one. And with Bernhard, with this notion of frost, is very much the same thing for me. It's that all the characters are placed into a setting that is so nihilistically unapologetic that it's already captured them they've accepted their fate they've accepted that that warm day against frost is never going to come again and from that they are then entered into what it really is to be human from uh, from that position and at no point do not, not once um does the novel warm up and I'm very thankful for to, to pessimistic writers and in this case to Bernhard for not sort of bowing down it's one of my few not necessarily a complaint because I don't think he's necessarily trying to do it but at times Cormac McCarthy will throw in a small seed of warmth which often feels a little unneeded um, another extract Listen, these tragedians, listen to them. That stubborn, deaf-mute breed of snakes' tongues, listen to them. The monstrously unappetizing republic of all-powerful idiocy, listen to them. This unsolicited, shameless parliament of hypocrites. There are the dogs, there is their yap, there is death. Death in all its wild profusion, death with all its frailty. Death with its stink of quotidian crime. Death. This last recourse of despair. The basilus of monstrous unendingness. The death of history. The death of impoverishment. Death. Listen. 
the death that I don't want, that no one wants, that no one wants anymore. There it is. Death. The yap. Listen. The unlawful drowning of reason. The refusal to give evidence of all supposition. The spastic smack of soft brain on concrete. On the concrete floor of human dementia. Listen to my views on the yap. Listen. And that is the sort of thing that Strauss is constantly, incessantly stating. Um, and behind this in the novel, because if you were just given this, it may not carry itself right through. And, and I'll get to my singular complaint about the novel soon it's probably the first time i've really had a criticism of one of the novels a, a clear criticism that uh, of one of the novels which i've reviewed um but this this notion of okay you've got the town you've got the pessimism you've got these few characters if we just had that it might not all hold together it might drag now there is these other elements um which no doubt connect to bernhardt's biography which i don't know well at all uh, if anything um, first one is war. This uh, war as a background of their, the mining town being near a forest, which is a fantastic scene in the novel, which is recounted in almost in memory, cyclic memory, of the forest um, where battle had taken place and absolutely garish, horrendous murders between battling sides of war had taken place. Uh, was feel it was over time, you know, they first they just ignored it because they didn't want to go back there and there's all these bodies. Then eventually they had to go in there and deal with it and bury the bodies and then slowly they were they would salvage from the tanks, but as people opened the tanks they'd be blown up. And so over time the war, which has long since long since ended, long since gone, the sort of platonic form of war or the essence of war still resides in these peculiar artifacts which people went to to uh, salvage and just ended up killing and killing them and slowly and slowly this forest which had all this sort of war detritus uh, was either buried or taken away but this notion of an uh, of an of a hangover of the absolute abortion which is war protruding into the day-to-day -day reality of an of someone's understanding of the world uh, that at no point can something simply be because there anything that is is still in that same world where there was war and death and this horrendous um famine and this is one of the the instru interesting almost um psychoanalytical observations of strauss with regards to himself is that he in a sort of a more of a case of ennui um of malaise he sort of he he states you know his position as a painter his position of someone who's doing anything at all that really everything has fallen away uh that he doesn't really want much anymore he doesn't really do much anymore occasionally he'll have a drink in the in the inn the singular location really of the novel but he mentions that once everything has gone what really happens is that you begin to develop symptoms of illness because that's all that's left now um and there's a great unfolding of a, a dark nostalgia for strauss in the sense that something such as childhood was a was inherently meaningful and full of value for its own sake um and then as you move forward into old old age it's merely a case of this entropy and for him the the meaning then comes because there can't be the singular absence of anything and so once he's got rid of all those things which he used to do and used to enjoy or used to engross himself within all that's left is a is illness and he is ill he has terrible terrible foot pain which he himself understands as psychosomatic and he's constantly in pain and he's got headaches and his head is as heavy as as i mentioned in that first quote and um but he doesn't really seek to do anything about it because i think perhaps he uh is, is somewhat a little bit indulgent in it as something at least for him to anchor himself to um 
and eventually for me so the criticism i have is the way i've described it so far you might be thinking well that sounds sounds a bit uh sort of you know i mentioned miserable at the start it sounds a bit uh exasperating and and this is actually my criticism is that such novels such as these which and books such as these which which attempt to utilize pessimism nihilism in a very personable day-to-day -day existential manner um or you could say in pessimism after after an existential crisis or something of this kind but more so a pessimism and a nihilism or a potent nihilism or definitely a passive nihilism books which which attempt to do this as a means to unfolding the human condition um equally need to realize the limitations of such and i when i went i will probably fairly soon read another bernhard just in chronological order but when i went to look at his other texts i realized the majority of them after this one are are either less than 200 pages or are about 200 pages whereas this one is 350 and i would say the last 100 pages of the book um i'm not going to say weren't needed but could have been condensed into a more uh, potent uh, prose and unapologetic nature earlier on and in a sense as well the conclusion of the book um where whereby the unnamed protagonist does he writes some letters to the doctor for me it didn't for me perhaps this is the way it was it's meant to be read or meant to be understood for me there had been no real resolution and, and ultimately the protagonist had been not so much he didn't wasn't fully possessed by strauss's uh, misanthropic worldview but um he did it appeared to me they didn't really know what to say and he had to come up with a lot of empty highfalutin language to sort of just fob this case off to his superior because he wasn't entirely sure what to make of it at all um i'll do one last extract and then summarize our teachers should do their work in abattoirs not read from books but swing hammers wield saws and apply knives reading should be taught from the coiled intestines and not from useless lines in books the word nectar should be traded in forthwith for the word blood you see said the painter the abattoir is the only essentially philosophical venue the abattoir is the classroom and the lecture hall the only wisdom is an abattoir wisdom a truth truth untruth all added up come to the vast abattoir immatriculation which i would like to make compulsory for humans for new humans and those tempted to become humans knowledge in the world is not abattoir knowledge and it lacks thor thoroughness the abattoir makes possible a radical philosophy of thoroughness we had gone into the slaughterhouse let's go said the painter in me the smell of blood turns into the extraordinary the smell of blood is the only parity let's go otherwise i should have to uproot the possibility of new intellectual disciplines from my own thinking materiality and i don't have the strength for that he took large steps and said the beast bleeds for the human and knows it meanwhile the human doesn't bleed for the beast and doesn't know it the human is the incomplete beast the beast could be fully human do you understand what i mean the one is disproportionate to the other and the one is massively dark to the other neither is for the other neither excludes the other now admittedly and i think bernhard quite rightly does this there are times when strauss's monologues are clearly just indulgent and there's times they border on the nonsensical because this is a man who man who's completely lost to in the in the same way that people might create a saintly ideal to follow he's created a pessimistic ideal to follow and is finding any means to sort of prophesize for the present that is already there for him and even though that that statement came across in a nietzschean light i don't think there is such a thing behind this novel it, one one of the reasons i really enjoyed it was because i don't enjoy pessimism where hope is shoehorned into it and hope doesn't arrive here 
And I don't like needless coincidences to try save something. Um, this is a maybe I'd even say it's like post pessimistic in the or pessimistic realism. If we think of Mark Fisher's book Capitalist Realism in that political acceptance of capitalism as as already winning the day, like you have to accept that it's already here. The Frost is a post pessimistic novel because. It's not a question of whether or not it's going to be going. There's going to be meaning or value. There isn't. They are gone. We are in this. This is this is what we have to accept. And Strauss is someone who, who is perhaps in that in between space before something might be built, and that's the worst space to be because he's perhaps had a taste of some old. You know, he used to be a painter, so he's had a taste of beauty and art and value and meaning and family as we 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 figure out earlier on he's had a taste of that and so he's in that immediate space and likely knows he will you know he's too old now to really begin to build something anew in a creative sense um and so he's espousing just a view of of transition into something else which he can't really see if there's ever going to be that thing but bernhard doesn't comment on either or side because there isn't enough time to do that these people's lives aren't long enough for that and so we're caught in this uh we're caught in a frost, right? That's what a frost is. Um, maybe that's the only the only place you could find some hope if you really had to look for it. I don't really care about that. But, you know, the town Veng probably is never going to not be in a frost because it's in the mountain. But the notion of a frost is not, not a full wintry snow and also not full spring day as this thing that just bites into your very being. Um, but also, we can admittedly state that frost is a, is a, is a state of becoming it's immediate state so that is also there but it, it it's it's an enjoyable novel well enjoyable if you're into pessimism such as myself it really is great as a debut it's absolutely astounding it does drag i will admit it does drag it didn't need to be as long as it as it is and it's not nowhere near his most well-known work you know it's his first novel and not the one as many people are talking about so i'd like to actually slowly go slowly go through his novels um but uh you know i like to instead of really giving a disclaimer i would give it seven or eight out of ten if i was to do that but it, I, this is a novel for the months of august and february when nothing's happening and the coffee's burnt and you got up too late and the day's already gone and you need something to do and uh you you need a you need a master who isn't above you but is above you in your misery <laughs> they've been more miserable than you um and it's a great book for that and uh highly recommend it for those times. Thank you.